Our first guest on the show is a legendary vocalist, songwriter, singer, and um, I mean, what, what is there to say about our first guest except, well, let's see, she is a, a, an alumnus of the University of Colorado, not this university, the, uh, the University of Colorado, not Northern, oh well. Bill Clinton was inspired to name his daughter Chelsea after her version of the Joni Mitchell song, Chelsea Morning. Uh, she's got an honorary doctorate from the Pratt Institute, and she is a Grammy winner for both sides now. And, um, well, I mean, you probably know dozens of her songs, as I do, and we'll be playing a few as well. But before we play some Judy Collins songs, let's talk to Judy Collins, because she is on the phone with us. Judy, are you there? I'm here. Judy, welcome, welcome to the neighborhood, and thank you, first of all, ever so much for for calling into the show. And I uh, wanted to, to just say how great it is also to have a Colorado win. Well, you weren't born in Colorado, but you've spent a good chunk of, of your life here, haven't you? No, I was born in Seattle, but moved to Colorado when I was nine. So I really consider myself almost a native Coloradoan. I live in New York now, but I spend a lot of time here, and I'm in Colorado at the moment, up in Vail. Up in Vail, and also you'll be playing at um, in Boulder on February 25th, which is the reason... I'll be in Boulder, I'll be in Telluride next weekend, I'll be in Grand Junction next weekend, So, and I was at, <clears throat> last night I was in Aspen at the Wheeler Opera House, so this is a Colorado singing and uh, R&R trip. Well, are you... Do you love it every time you come back to color? Do you still have family here and friends and all that? Oh, yes, I do, and I do love it a lot. I wanted to add to my Pratt doctorate. I have, I'm have. i a doctor, I'm an honorary doctor four times, <gasps> and one of them is Pratt. One of them is the New School of Social Research University in New York, which I'm very proud of because when I first moved to, call, to New York in 1963, I... Uh, one of the first things I did was to take a Russian course down at the New School and go to see Krishnamurti at the New School. And so I was honored when they called me a few years ago to give me an honorary doctorate. It was my first. So those are always important. Wow. Well, actually, you should probably at some point record Dylan's Day of the Locust if you haven't already. Since you've, you've stepped I haven't, to but I'm sure I'll get to it. Life is long. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and we should tell everybody, aside from the fact that you'll be playing all these concerts in Colorado, you do have a new album out called Bohemian, and we'll be playing a, a track or two from that. Um, and Good. I guess that, well, yeah, I mean. And I have a new book out, you know, called Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, which is, um, I wanted to call it Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll, and the Music That Changed a Generation. But it does use the title of the song that Stephen Stills wrote for me in 1968. And it also is an insight, I hope, on, on the music business as well as on uh, one of the lives of the music business that's still around. Which would be you, thank God. And, and it's kind of nice that you're, you're writing a memoir that is at least, I assume this one is a lot more joyful and content and happy than some of the, the memoirs you've had to write in the past Few years. Well, one has to do what one has to do at the moment it's required, and uh, I just take dictation, as some of us say. <laughs> In other words, the spirit comes to you, and, and you know it just flows out of you. Is is it different or difficult writing books as opposed to songs? No, it's it's natural. Um, I I have worked very hard to be able to say that and to do that, but it is what I do. So I write, I sing, I play the piano, I practice, I work in my journal, I listen to music. It's all part of the fabric of the life I lead. Well, speaking of, you know, there are so many different questions I wanted to ask you, and each time you, you answer a question, it leads to another one. So I guess, um, listen to music. What's playing on your iPod or your CD player these days? Who are you listening to? Last night, as I was driving from Aspen, which I mentioned on my Facebook page because I was so thrilled, I was listening to Adele's song, Rolling the Deep, which I'm crazy about. I'm crazy about Adele. <laughs> and listening to Leonard Cohen's new album, Old Ideas, which is so brilliant, beyond brilliant. There are a lot of other things on my iPod and my computer and my telephone, but those were the things that were up for me today. 
Well, can, can I ask what you think? Of, well, and, and by the way, if people don't know, you, you even have a full album of Leonard Cohen songs that you have done, as well as uh, an album of um, Dylan songs and Lennon McCartney songs. But um, oh. And there I go. I, I just lost the question <laughs> I was about to ask. Oh, yes, the, the whole change, the sea change in the music industry. How has that affected you from, say, the days at Elektra and then CBS when you put out an album, you tour, and that's how it was done? How do you feel it's different now, better or worse, or both? It's, it's very much the same in one respect, and that is that you're always thinking to write the greatest song that you've ever written, and to find the song that will move you to record it. You're looking for ways to sustain what you do, to make it better, to sharpen it, to get better and better. I mean, that's what it's all about. I've been doing this for being paid for it for 51 years. And to sustain yourself physically and emotionally and spiritually and keep up to the mark about where you want to go to keep connected to to your creative sources and to do the things that make you feel good and make you able to do the work that's not changed some of the avenues are different some of the i mean hmm. you know the grammys was a big fancy to do with a lot of things that i didn't like and some that i did but that that too hasn't really changed there's a lot more of it sometimes but fundamentally it's about the song you know i was um very impressed this year with with Chris Brown. I don't know a thing about Chris Brown, but I liked his athleticism, I liked his musicality, and I loved his song. I thought, well, that's a very talented writer. It's all about, for me, finding, listening to, being inspired by, and pursuing a life in music. And, and so I take note of, I try to take note of what goes on. That's, that's great. And can I ask, um, having, as you said, 51 paid years in the music business and have you found that it is more difficult now to for you to tour physically and emotionally or is it the same do you, have you slowed down do you take lessons do you do you do voice work what do you do i don't i've had some i've had wonderful training so i know how to do what i do which is a godsend hmm. i also know how to travel which i've learned over these years i've never I've never retired, so I can't make a comeback. I, uh, I've gotten better, I think, at what I do. And also, I do love what I do. So as far as I'm concerned, I treat the airports like gymnasiums and enjoy them. Okay. I mean, how, how many days or weeks a year do you spend traveling? I'm out about 100. Last year, I was out 120 days. What? And you don't see that lessening in the next few years? I mean, hopefully, you'll, you'll still be very no, much... No, I don't see it lessening in, in any... In any in any appreciable manner, I mean, it, first of all, you're I, I'm I'm wanted in more places than I ever was. So I travel even more than I did. Of course, obviously, I'm doing 120 shows a year, and I might have done, let's say, 60 10 years ago. So that's altered, hmm. but it's still the same thing. I mean, I find that audiences of all sizes and all shapes and all all um, localities are great and I enjoy the journey as they say well, I think that's great that's what it's, it's obviously completely all about so let's if you don't mind roll it back a little bit to the beginning stages of your realizing that you could sing was it from from hearing your early recordings on like so early in the spring and and records like that and you know maids and golden apples was was say Ronnie Gilbert like your kind of idol or something or how did you pattern your singing style after well I didn't pattern my singing after anybody I was raised in a musical family my dad was a great singer he sang not only Rodgers and Hart but he sang all the Irish uh, songs the classic Danny Boy and carry dancers and uh so and i had a wonderful musical background i played the piano seriously and but also i sang in jack blues dance band and when i picked up a guitar at 14 i was i considered myself not particularly a singer but certainly a storyteller and it wasn't until three or four albums in that i was able to kind of glom on to the idea of figuring out how to sing I knew what I wanted to say, and I knew the songs that I wanted to sing, which I was choosing. 
and there were many people that I listened to and loved, but my models really were, I don't know, people like my dad who knew how to tell a story and make it make the lyric understandable. And, uh, of course, I listened to everybody from Bob Gibson and Josh White and worked a lot with the Smother bro- Smothers huh. Brothers in Colorado and... Uh, and Sonny Terry and Ronnie, Ronnie, uh, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, and got to New York and opened at Gertie Soak City in 1961 in February. And guess who was my opening act? Wait, wait. Arlo what, like? Guthrie was 13, and he, <laughs> everybody in New York was there. And I thought they came to see me, but they wanted to see just how Woody's kid was doing. And um, so there were a lot of people whose music I loved, but I did not pattern myself, as you say, after any of them. Oh, okay, no, I was just thinking maybe the Weebers, because they, they sort of put out a style that was very forward, or, or certainly um, Ronnie Gilbert did, of, of singing from the chest and forward and really, like, powerful. It wasn't like sweet operetta singing. And certainly in your early recordings, um, some of them, you had that folky kind of powerful I wouldn't call it a belt, but I think yeah, I, I imagine you know them. I'm well, saying, you know who yeah. it was. It was Judy Collins singing the songs that she chose. Well, that's fine. That that's great. Can I? Ask? And actually, yeah. through those years, you know, I think that the choice of material and the lyrics are so important. The whole point is how to get the story across, how to phrase, how to be clear, how to. And by the way, that is actually the secret of singing. Um, a lot of those people that you're talking about don't don't sing anymore, can't sing anymore. And one of the things that I was very lucky about was that I met in 1965 when I was losing my voice and literally falling apart because of all the traveling. I found a great teacher who knew what to do Hmm. and what to say. And for 32 years I studied with him. So that was really the foundation of keeping the instrument in shape, which is the whole point. Yeah, it's great to have all the songs and to write the songs and to sing. And some people seem to have a natural knack at it. Certainly Woody did. But uh, for most of us who are human, it takes another kind of uh, inspiration to figure out the mechanics of how to keep healthy and keep the voice healthy. So I would never recommend a teacher to anybody because I don't don't have any great faith in most teachers. Mm -hmm. But I do know that I was lucky, and also that I listened to people who know how to sing. You know, I was a great... And, you know, those who can't sing, some of them have great talent. Uh, But the point for me was that I had to figure out what the strength was that I had and then throw everything at it so that I could keep it there because there were a lot of other things that were against me, and I talk about a lot of them in the book. One of them was the fact that I was an alcoholic, so... I was always struggling against, the one, on the one side, the necessity for traveling and touring and singing and getting up and showing up and being on time and doing a record every year and hunting for material and going on the road and doing shows and television and international travel. That was the one side of the deal. The other side was that I was drinking myself to death. So, you know, that was my battle when did, and one when, of the ones that just about brought me down. May I ask when did the? And again, the, I was lucky sure. because I found, uh, I I, found, I went into treatment in 1978, so I don't have to deal with that particular demon anymore. But there were years when I did, and I wanted to write about it and to talk about this journey, as to how it came about, who I met, who I hung out with, who I made music with, um, and what was my life in the midst of this incredible social and political and musical turmoil that I was living in. Well, absolutely. Can, can I ask, though, it, it, when did the drinking really start or get out of hand? Was it when you were already famous and traveling and you were turning to it to just get through it? Or was it already even sort of before then? Oh, no. I'm an Irish person with an <laughs> Irish uh, illness. And, <laughs> and there are other nationalities who have it, too. But we have the Irish virus, and it was in my genes, and it was pretty predictable, I would say, always was there. And, and was there any, when you started to explore why, aside from your obviously being Irish and being in the culture, did you suddenly dig up some particular nugget that said, oh, that's why I'm doing, I'm meditating no, there something. there is no why. There really is no why. In addiction, why? there is no why. There's just the if or if not. And the trick is to find an if not and to 
I went to treatment, which is why I, where I found out the if not was <laughs> if you don't drink, life is going to improve. You know, I used to have a friend who said, uh, you know, when, when I, mm-hmm. it's not that when I drank I always got into trouble. But when I got into trouble, I was always drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, how much trouble did you get into, really? I mean, oh, lots, and I'll tell you all about it in Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. You can read all about it. <laughs> oh, okay, that's that's a teaser, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, please tell me. I her, hope so. Where can they get Sweet Judy Blue? What what publisher? And and I'm sure every bookstore. It's a Random House uh, publication. It's on Crown, and uh, you can get it everywhere. I'm sure it really has a bookstore. And if not, you can go online and get it at Barnes & Noble online. You can get it at Amazon. You can get it on my website. You can go to Random House. You can go anywhere they sell books or Kindles. Or yeah. I also made an audio of this book, which is a first. I, As you mentioned before, I've written a number of books about one aspect or another of my life, but I've never done, which is really crazy, I've never done an audio you know somebody who's a singer and who right. records dozens of albums over the course of 50 years I've never I never before did an audio but there is one available and uh, I sing on it by the way in case Ooh. anybody wanted to know do you, do you sing songs from bohemian or it's just songs or little a cappella things to illustrate your point or what what are the songs on there for in the book yeah, I the audio book yeah I wanted to illustrate the writers, both myself and others, and so every, I don't know, few pages, you'll find a couple of lines of lyric, and when I came to those couple of lines of lyric in the reading, I just sang them. That's sure. Oh, oh, yeah, abs- absolutely. Um, I think in the audio, by the way, in the audio, there are five songs of that I've written, and one of them is from the new album, from Bohemian, which I wrote about my mother. It's called In the Twilight. She died 14 months ago, and oh. um, it was a very hard loss for all of us. And I think it's, you know, it's probably the best thing I've ever written, probably because it's about my mother, and because it, also because I think it's a portrait of a time. You know, she was 94, and she lived through a lot of things, and including my father and all of us. And um, I, I, I feel very strongly about the song as a kind of, I don't know, Stud Strickle always talks about the oral tradition, and, and there's a story in there about the century, really, about the two centuries. She lived through all of one and part of another. Wow. And can I ask, was My Father your first song that you wrote? No, My Father was the fourth song that I wrote, oh, okay. however, so not too far from off. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first one was Since You've Asked, and then I wrote Albatross and a song called Skyfell, which has died a, a, a death that was <laughs> earned, I think. And then my father, who, and it's interesting because I, I wrote the song about my father probably three weeks before his death, and I was going to see him. I was coming back from England. I was going to co- coming to Colorado, and he died before he heard the song, and The same thing happened with my mother in that about three weeks before she died, I started the song, and I did not finish it until after her death, so she didn't hear that either. But she heard plenty of songs about my dad, let me tell you. (laughs) Well, your dad seemed like a pretty special... And probably heard enough about him to, you know, uh, plenty. (laughs) More than enough. Here's kind of a Wikipedia question, but he was blind, or, or so it said on the, uh, well, and, and also a radio DJ, as you said, a mu- musician. But was he he was blind, or not? He was blind from the age of four, and was uh, very successful. You know, went to all the schools. <coughs> the school in in uh, <coughs> Gooding was called the School for the Deaf, Dumb, and Blind, and the school in Lewiston was called the Normal School. Right. Uh, go figure. <laughs> and uh, then he went to the University of Idaho on a scholarship. He was terribly bright and, of course, a brilliant musician and singer. And he was never a disc jockey. He never played a record in his life. He sang everything live on the radio, oh. had guests. We met Bob Hope and George Shearing and Red Skelton and The Shadow. And all kinds of people came to be on his radio show as guests, as people will do, and play the piano, sing, dance, tell stories. And then he would sing Rogerson Hart and uh, Irish songs and read Emerson quotes and Dylan Thomas and uh, and and talk politics. I mean, he was very outspoken. It was a kind of old-fashioned radio where you, 
you had he he told Mae West jokes and he and he talked philosophy and and uh, was generally uplifting. Let's say that. Do you still have? Sort of like uh, your show. Do, well, thank you. Do, do you still have tapes? Where is there any preservation? Uh, not a lot, <clears throat> but a couple. Yeah. Oh, cool. I mean, I'm, I think I think that's. That's particularly wonderful. And uh, speaking again still of songwriting, I am wondering about one of my favorite songs of yours, um, which I think is one of the best story songs that I've ever come across called The Blizzard that, that you did. Was uh, that just in your head, or was it based on somebody's real experience? or why? It was just, It's just a lovely piece know, Everything of, you yeah. write is based on your experience, so it's okay. just that the poetic license comes in and you take dictation. Um, I had some concerts planned in <clears throat> in Aspen at the um, Opera House, which I was, which is where I was last night, and um, at the Wheeler Opera House. And I was, it was, the shows were made into a a television special by Disney called Coming Home, and it was a it was a kind of a family reunion. We had many family reunions, but this one was filmed by Disney and. Uh, we all met in Denver, and then we drove up to the mountains, and we had a wonderful time. And I, Chris Christofferson, was my guest on these concerts. And as I was planning the shows and the music that was going to be on the shows, I kept thinking, you know, my father wrote a great song about Colorado when he when we moved here in 1950, uh, 1949. Yeah. And I thought, well, it's pathetic that I don't have a song about Colorado. So I sat down in a snowstorm in Connecticut and wrote the blizzard about a snowstorm in Colorado. Oh, wow. I, it's just like that. I mean, the economy of storytelling, it has a little bit of everything in, in that song. And I'm just, you know, I, I, well, I think it's, it's one, one of your best achievements. Well, it's one of my favorite songs to perform, certainly. I do love it. I think it's, you know, I wrote it when I was coming off the the first major biography that I wrote, which was called Trust Your Heart. And that was... Um, <clears throat> published by Houghton Mifflin in 1987. And I had spent, what, four years, I think, writing that, about the same time as I've spent writing Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. And in between, I've written eight other, seven other books, wow. actually, but one of which is a mystery. So you find, you see that I like, I like doing that. But I had come out of that first big phase of writing for this big biography with you know, the real deal with a real editor, Nan Talese is my editor. What a oh, wow. marvelous, marvelous editor she is. And I think that the idea of telling stories and being able to do it in music was was fueled by that writing. I think everything everything that you do that's creative intersects with whatever else that, it's your, that you're doing. So that you're, if you're painting, you're, you're affected by music, you're affected by other art, you're affected by whatever you do, whether it's gardening or or um, child care or cooking, you know, it's all creative. So mm-hmm. I, I'm not surprised that the song came out when it did, but I do think that there was a precedent for it, and I think it was doing all that writing in uh, Trust Your Heart. Wow. Can I ask, um, and, and invariably I'm sure you're asked this question all the time, but um, was, the, was doing Send in the Clowns, an obvious thing because you hadn't done that much in the way of Broadway or, or that kind of popular song. Um, I mean, did it come to you and say, "Oh yeah, absolutely," or was it like, "Oh well, we'll try it," and then it came out great? And you know, how did how did that? Click? I don't ever try it. I don't ever try it. Mm. If I feel passionate about something, I will do it. But it's like a love affair. You either go wholehearted or you say, "No, no, thanks." I um, I had. There was a precedent. Of course, the whole precedent is my whole previous life with the music True. of Rodgers and Hart and Rodgers and Hammerstein and George Gershwin, everything I grew up in with with my dad. But also the precedent was also in, in 1966 on the album called In My Life. I had done music from... Par- oh, from uh, Marat Saab, that's right. Three, uh, from Three Penny Opera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, and also from the Marat Saad. So there was theater precedent. However, what what lured me into uh, Sent in the Clowns was the fact that a friend of a friend of Leonard Cohen's and a friend of mine called me one day and said, and that was an album on which I was doing. I'd already written Houses and Born to the Breed, 
couple other things, I yeah. think. And I knew I was going to do City of New Orleans, and I, I think so, right? Was that album? Yeah, City of New Orleans and uh, a couple other songs I was pretty sure of. And she sent me, this friend of ours, said to me, You've, there's a song in this play. I didn't know who Sondheim was. I hadn't had a clue. And she said, there's a song in this play that you've got to hear. And I said, oh, well, you know, <laughs> who knows? So she sent me the album. I put the needle on the track. I heard the song. I said, oh, my God. I called Hal Prince on the phone. And one of the things was that I already had a hit single, so people answered my phone calls. Right. And I said, listen, there's a great song in this play of yours. I didn't even know the name of the play. He said, I know, I know, I know. I said, it's in in the clowns. He said, I know, I know. He said, about 200 people have recorded it. I said, I don't care. I have to record it. And I I knew who I wanted to orchestrate it. I went straight to Jonathan Tunick, who did the orchestration for Sondheim, who does all of his orchestrations except for Into the Woods. I think that was the only one that he didn't hmm. do. Might have been and yeah. I said, hi, Jonathan, and he answered my call, too. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> And we've worked together many times since then, Jonathan and I. And, of course, his brilliance, he had done, of course, the whole score for Little Night Music. So, you know, that da-da-da-da, dee-dee-dee-dee with the English horn, that was him, of course. Right. Although the orchestration, although the harmonics are all in Sondheim's original piano versions, which is which blows my mind about Sondheim. He is so brilliant, beyond brilliant. That's the story of Sending the Clowns. And fortunately, I had a great record company. I had a great sales team on the record company. The marketing in that company was superior. Radio was poised for me. Mm -hmm. I had had a big hit with Sending the Clowns and Someday Soon with, uh, you know, even who knows where the time goes. Amazing Grace had just come off the charts big times for the second time. I think it was top ten or something. So they were ready for this when it happened. Now, that mm -hmm. has changed for me about the music business. Uh, it's not as accessible or as easy, and I'm not on a lecture anymore, which changed dramatically. So there were a lot of things going for that for that rendition of that song, and uh, I was very lucky. Is that, is that why you moved from Electra to CBS? Because Electra just wasn't that kind of label Electra, that it was? Electra changed dramatically. Jack Holzman left in 72. David Geffen took over, and David was behind the production of Judas, the Judas album hmm. on which uh, Sand in the Clowns appeared. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to say goodbye. Oh, oh, well, um, thank you very, very much. It's been an absolute delight talking with you. Uh, Judy Collins. Please, everybody, go see her in her various concerts in Colorado, including Boulder on the 25th. Please get her book, Sweet for Judy Blue Eyes, and uh, also get her album, Bohemian. Judy, um, I can only thank you so much for spending the time with us in the neighborhood. Best of luck to you, your music, your writing, and everything. Thank Dave, you. Dave, so it's been a pleasure. Have a beautiful day. You too. It's always a good day in Colorado. Isn't it then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you so Take much. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now.